Bien, mesdames, mesdemoiselles, messieurs. Well, uh, bonsoir. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Merci de votre good evening patience. and uh, Merci thank you for being so patient. Attention. And uh, thank you for vous the, avez fait preuve pendant la projection uh, de, de ce film. Uh, looking at the film with uh, so much uh, attention. So, uh, une the, the, manière so it is one way of vous avez remarqué understanding the, the dans le film que issue of the debate tonight. And so, there's, I mean, there's a sort of a, Uh, militarization of the topic, so it is not the only uh, outlook, and uh, this evening's debate is going to uh, show us different opinions on the way the debate is uh, presented. So it's called uh, the age of consequences. And uh, so, uh, 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 so it uh, has the merit that it shows that, you know, we're not just, uh, uh, it's not just bec become about becoming conscious of the problem, but, you know, we've already reached the age of the consequences. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about this evening. So uh, not many uh, stats. So this is uh, a bit uh, uh, worrisome to have too many numbers. So I'm going to give you three Uh, numbers that are going to give us a better idea. So one number that is catastrophic and uh, deserves attention. So we've been announced since uh, two, uh, by 2050, there'll be 250 million climatic refugees. And uh, in 2015, last official number, almost 20 million, 1920 million people have been displaced for uh, Uh, climate change reasons or uh, climate-related disasters. <laughs> so something else that's interesting, some are going to think that this may be... So we uh, estimate that 90% of the people who are, uh, give or take, having to exile themselves, will be people who will, uh, you know, stay within their own country. I mean, we the example of, uh, there's the example of Bangladesh we're going to talk about. It will be very interesting. Now let's talk terminology, and then I'll be introducing the uh, guests. So, uh, uh, okay, um, refugees, let's uh, forget about the uh, quotes. We need to know what it is that we're talking about. So while I was preparing this evening, I realized that uh, the terminology was very different and politically different that we use. We say... Uh, climatic refugees, but in many fields, climate refugees, and many will say, you shouldn't say refugees. Climate is okay. Refugees mm, 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 is okay. Climate refugees, no. So again, there's a lot of hypocrisy and uh, some optimist. Uh, some people talk about um, environmentally displaced people or environment displaced. And others said we'll talk about the eco refugees. I mean, you know, ecosystems. Why not? So reality is that uh, we are uh, in the uh, age of consequences, and uh, now I'm going to uh, call uh, my the panelists and uh, uh, invite them to uh, uh, come onto the stage. So, okay, two bits of information. The, uh, the, the debate will be in English. They'll be expressing themselves in English. And, of course, you have uh, uh, interpreters, and I'd like to already thank them for the incredible work uh, they do throughout this festival, because I think, you know, without them, I don't think we'd be able to understand another, one another. So congratulations. So I'll be expressing myself in French. And uh, the uh, debate will last about uh, one hour and 15 minutes, one hour and and a half, uh, 60 minutes with the panelists, and 30 minutes, 3-0 minutes, uh, will be for questions of the audience, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, we'll, but uh, that's, uh, and you will uh, have the floor, and that is what uh, is uh, so interesting and attractive about this festival. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce you to our guests, you know, three ladies, one gentleman. So, uh, so I mean, we definitely have a parody here, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce you to three ladies and one gentleman. So, so you'll be last, uh, sir. I'm going to start with the ladies. So, uh, so uh, far left, you have uh, Robin uh, Bronin, who's a lawyer and is the executive director of the Alaska Institute for Justice. Robin Bronin. And uh, so, so we're talking about social justice and environmental justice. And uh, God knows that uh, in Alaska, there's a lot uh, to be said. And thank you for actually coming such a long way to be with us this evening. So again, here we have, uh, you know, uh, ambassador of the Fiji Islands. So already we can imagine and we know the uh, consequences of uh, uh, global warming. And uh, madam, uh, thank you. And uh, I'd just like to remind you that until recently, you were head of negotiations at the COP23. 
So, so that you are totally immersed uh, in this issue that, you know, inside out. And, uh, okay, it's a play on words, right? Immersed. <laughs> and, uh, and you know things from the inside. Uh, to, my, to my right, we have the representative of the OIM, uh, and who's a um, and is a director of uh, the uh, yes, IOM. And uh, uh, General Munirut uh, Saman, uh, I hope I uh, pronounced your uh, name properly, the general, and as you were uh, the uh, political counselor of the president of Bangladesh, and uh, Bangladesh. So, uh, so this, uh, you'll tell us about this region of the world, and you're also president of a very important council that was called the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. Uh, and uh, I think the words are very clear, and uh, you will uh, have quite a lot to say, I think, about this film. So since we're talking about the film, um, I, uh, I heard a few people react during the screening. Once again, it is one way of uh, uh, presenting uh, matters. So, uh, so uh, uh, Mrs. LK, uh, what do you uh, think of this uh, uh, both military and intellectual approach of things? And it's not um, uninteresting interesting to present things in terms of state security. So in your opinion, is that enough? But uh, do we have to uh, also have a little bit more intellectual thought to all of this? It's very difficult to know where to begin um, on the subject or indeed uh, about the film. We struggle also in the migration field in a, an overly securitized presentation or perception of, of migrants all the time. Um, I, I think it's, it's very disturbing, but sometimes you need to have disturbing things to make people change, to make people act uh, in a new way, and, and that was something that the film brought out. But um, there was very little attention to governance issues, the use of resources on the military as opposed to on actually uh, spending money on creating greater resilience and addressing the, the environmental factors that, that people are facing. So it's, it's tricky, but um, it's sometimes useful that, that there is provocation of a particular point of view so that one can step back and assess, well, that is one view, but there are many others, and we need to look at the whole picture in a balanced way in order to be able to react uh, and act uh, appropriately. Mais est-ce qu'il est nécessaire d'avoir une approche, je dirais, uh, nécessaire de have uh, actually uh, an anxiety prone type uh, attitude from a, a pedagogical standpoint and you uh, at the uh, IOM how, how do you uh, approach the problem and the your mission is to make sure that migrations uh, happen that's in your mandate that it happens uh, with the most humanity as possible so how do you pr present what some people already call the uh, well, yes, disaster coming so to travel migration mm -hmm. um, but we don't advocate for migration as being a good thing or a, a solution in itself a lot of what we do is enabling people genuinely to have an informed choice whether to move or not and maybe later in the discussion we'll get into what are the things that motivate people to move, what are the underlying things and, and what are the actual triggers that, that make people take the decision actually to move. Because many people may think they want to move or say in surveys that they intend to migrate, but the, but the majority do not. Um, but I think... Um, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, the, the question is, the, the is shock, the prices, the so again, this you know this uh, anxiety-raising approach. You can tend to to create extreme reactions when you frighten people. Um, a lot of what we do is also trying to say migration has been happening from the beginning of humankind, and it isn't a threat in itself, um, and that people have benefited from migration, the individuals, the societies that they, they go from and the societies to which they go have all benefited in the majority of cases from migration. But clearly there are problems and issues mm -hmm. in terms of uh, time scale or numbers of people sometimes that, that can create fear. And fear can be used and abused by politicians. And that too, I think, is where the film perhaps um, heads in uh, uh, beyond the watershed of uh, of what is 
uh, appropriate education mm -hmm. on issues mm -hmm. uh, without the, the fear mongering. On n'a pas d'hommes ou de femmes politiques. So, uh, so, so in a rather uh, uh, pejorative connotation, the uh, politicians, men and women. So politicians may want to uh, frighten people and say, you know, careful, uh, it's going to happen to us, and uh, saying this is a catastrophe and we may not be able to avoid. So we have uh, a, a military man uh, on stage. So you were a member of the advisory board. So when you, uh, after seeing this film, uh, so these uh, military personnel, uh, people close to the military, who are actually uh, calling the pulling the alarm bell, and uh, so do you agree with this uh, message uh, uh, that uh, uh, comes through the film, and in which uh, the military is saying, careful, 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 don't count too much on us. Uh, it may not be, you know, it might not be our job to uh, actually uh, look after all these uh, future refugees. How do you feel about this, General? Thank you. Uh, what I want to say, the film only warns people, policymakers, that these are some of the consequences that might come. The military believes and works on the concept of long-term planning, and many of the consequences will need long-term planning, both at the level of the execution, at the level of the policy making. So therefore, it is very pertinent for the military to tell the policy makers, the political leaders, that you need to look at this problem and think ahead. Because when the problem comes, that is too late for us to do anything. So it is just a warning shot that these are the consequences, and the policymakers need to take note of that and prepare ahead, because so that when the consequences really come, you don't get into a complete mess of things. Imagine a few thousands of people coming to the shores of Europe. What kind of consequences it had on very many political systems in Europe. But when millions of people are on the move as climate migrants or climate refugees, then that is a situation for which we need to plan not only years, but decades ahead. And that is a warning that the film is trying to give us. You venez de prononcer vous-même le mot, la terminologie. Use the word climate refugees yourself. So, uh, madam, so from, an, from the uh, IOM official uh, position, does one actually pronounce the word climate refugees? It's on that. Um, it doesn't exist in international law because the Refugee Convention mm -hmm. has very specific categories of people uh, which were identified at the time that the Convention was negotiated in 1951. And at that time, people were not thinking of, of all the other mm -hmm. ways in which people may need to leave their country or the causes for which that has happened, including environmental ones, but also that non-state actors can cause people to have to leave where they would normally be living. Madame l'ambassadrice, est-ce que vous vous seriez d'accord? Est-ce que vous êtes um, Mrs. Ambassador, do you agree uh, with using this term uh, climate refugee, the word refugee uh, w w which uh, will have to be assimilated to a uh, status of refugee uh, as uh, appears in the 1951 convention. So for you is there, so actually in the terminology, I'm not talking about the problem, I'm talking about the terminology, climate refugees, the refugees, how does that sit with you? I think um, as a legal term, the description of what is a refugee does not fit with the circumstances of people who have to move as a result of climate mm. change. So legally speaking, I think it's absolutely right to say that uh, the word climate refugee does not fit well with the uh, terminology around the refugee convention. Having said that, the reality of the lives of many people in the Pacific is that they now have to plan to move. And in fact, in many villages in my own country, in Fiji, they are already being moved and relocated. Uh, and they are being relocated as a result of climate change. So this is a reality with which the law has not kept up. It would be needed for these refugees to have a right to a status so they're not victims of persecutions as you have in the 1951 Convention according to race, color. So, so, so refugee, quote unquote, so the economic refugees would become political refugees and uh, could be actually seeking asylum in a neighboring country. So what would, it, what would be needed? What would you need for mentalities and the uh, texts to change? 
the sense of imperative, the sense of urgency that we now had to move on in this legal mm. reality, and we need to have a framework which describes the situation that we are facing. Having said that, I think it is also a reality that people move not only for one reason necessarily, but for a combination. Mm. And I think the film really talks about these combination of factors, eco economic realities, political reasons, and the environment. So somehow the reality of people's lives have to be reflected in the law or the law has mm -hmm. no purpose. So I think what we're looking at now is a movement towards an international framework which fits with the reality of people's lives, particularly in, in, uh, in societies from small island developing mm -hmm. states where in fact the sea level that is rising mm -hmm. um, is causing the displacement of people. Is being done in your country to uh, prepare uh, the, any contingency plans for uh, uh, climate uh, disasters? What is being done in the field in your country? I think two things um, important. One is internal displacement. Mm -hmm. So this is when we move people from one village uh, to another place within the country. And for that, uh, we are working very hard on internal displacement, what we call relocation guidelines. Mm -hmm. In the relocation guidelines, it's really important that we integrate human rights because the human dignity of people is absolutely paramount and not just in the circumstances of moving, but in the decision to move. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the question of when a village is ready to move must be a decision made by the village, not imposed on them by government. And so this whole issue of democratic participation in that decision is one that has to be integrated in relocation guidelines. Mm. The second issue is when whole countries disappear. And this is a reality that the Pacific now has to face. Despite all the work that we do and the urgency of climate action, we know that there are some countries in the Pacific which will not exist one day. And for that, that needs a regional and international framework, which I believe our region needs to, to take some urgent steps about. Mais est-ce qu'il n'y a pas des raisons d'être pessimiste alors que... I mean, are there, aren't there reasons to be pessimistic uh, where, whereas in the environmental context a lot of people are denying the uh, existence of a, a climate change. You know who I'm thinking of, of course. I mean, there are people who deny that this is going on. I, I don't think you'll find those people in the Pacific. Oh, non, je, par, je parle même... <laughs> non, je, je pense que ce sera... No, dans, dans no. Well, no, no, you, 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 no, on other continents. No, t t t on a more serious note, I mean, how to get these people to evolve? I mean, you have those who deny the existence uh, of uh, a global warming or climate change, and then you those who, uh, in any case, don't want to actually uh, go down the legal road and to have a, a status. Uh, so can, you know, sh will your voice still be heard? I understand the sensitivities around not wanting a legal framework. I think there are a number of of sensitivities around litigation and compensation and loss and damage. These are understandable sensitivities and we've heard them many, many times. I think though, for our region, this reality now has to be faced by our people. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not the United Nations is going to be interested in an international convention at this stage, we don't know. But we do know that there seems to be a need in our region to start to talk about the circumstances in which sovereign countries will have to move. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't wait for your island to disappear before you move, mm -hmm. because very soon the uh, water supplies become salinated and they become undrinkable. Or there's acidification of the, of the ocean, and so you can no longer live off the mm -hmm. ocean. And this is a serious matter for the Pacific. So the question of when to move, the exodus, that, I think, has to be a decision made by a sovereign country. And I don't think there can be any interference with that. Mm. But the circumstances of the moving, I think, collectively, as a community in the Pacific, I think we need to start mm. thinking about that. Can I come in? Yeah, just a minute. Uh, je, je aussi. So you've just pronounced the word exodus, uh, which uh, uh, this gives a very uh, important uh, dimension to these people. So, you know, from the uh, viewpoint of Alaska, uh, Madam, could you give us examples of what is uh, happening 
I mean, we don't know everything that's happening as regards uh, climate change in Alaska. I mean, you have uh, soil erosion, acidification, and you have the permafrost. So give us examples of, of what uh, your organization is doing in Alaska uh, to both raise awareness amongst people, uh, to uh, get them to uh, uh, understand what the problems are, and to uh, suggest uh, solutions. What is happening uh, in your uh, part of the world? What can you tell us? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. So as the film showed, the Arctic is in a massive meltdown. Um, there was just a federal govern government report issued um, by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in December, and it said that the Arctic regions of the world will no longer be frozen in the decades ahead as it has been for the last millennia. And that, of course, is having extreme consequences for the indigenous peoples who live in Alaska. I'll also mention that um, when you were having a massive snowstorm here just a couple of weeks ago, the temperatures at the North Pole were eight degrees Celsius above normal. And on the north coast of Greenland, there were, since January 1st, there have been 61 hours recorded where the temperatures have been above freezing. So Greenland is actively melting. And so the consequences, um, so for me, the term climate refugee is seriously problematic because the term refugee is to denote that a government, a national government, is either actively persecuting it, the people within its population or not taking steps to stop the perpetrators of per persecution happening within that country. And as we know from many countries of the world, countries are trying to protect their citizens and it's us in the global north who are not reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and causing people to lose the places that they love and so in alaska what's happening so we have rapidly decreasing arctic sea ice the scientific consensus says that there could be no arctic sea ice in the ocean during the summertime as early as 2020 and in the wintertime, what that means is the Arctic sea ice used to be the barrier for the storms that we get in. It used to be just the fall time, but now it's from October until now. And we don't get hurricanes, at least not yet in Alaska, but we do get hurricane strength winds. And without the Arctic sea ice to protect the coast, these indigenous communities that are not connected by road systems, some live on barrier islands, some live in river delta areas, they are being inundated. They've been inundated constantly this past winter. And so there, several of them have made the decision to relocate. And um, as the ambassador said from Fiji, this is going to be the greatest human rights challenge of our time because as a human rights issue, the right to self-determination and the right to make the choice of whether or not you leave your home is a fundamental right that needs to be protected. And the reason why this issue is so difficult is because we have no governance models to determine at what point in time should a, a community of people or should a national government make that decision to proactively protect their population. So, um, I'd like to turn to you, General, for you to uh, uh, tell us what is happening in Bangladesh, uh, uh, what is the threat, and we know that you have a big problem along the coast. Uh, were there mistakes made by allowing uh, all these people to uh, move that? Uh, you know, what's the uh, remedy there, and what's going to happen in the coming year? And is it true, as I read somewhere, that in any case, we know that you know most of uh, people who will have to be displaced uh, will stay uh, in their country, in Bangladesh, which means the international community somewhere is saying it's of no concern to us. I'm quite surprised to hear that. But anyway, I'll, I'll first try to come back to one issue that was raised by the ambassador. Uh, my understanding is that what is going to happen, happen in, the, in the Pacific will not remain a regional problem. We live in a very interconnected world where everything is interlinked to one another. Insecurity anywhere will ultimately result in insecurity elsewhere. The basic question that comes to my mind about disappearance of countries, 
we have not had an incident when a complete country disappears. So it is going to open up very fundamental legal questions in front of us. One example is that the unclosed maritime boundary regime that we have built for ourselves are based on coastlines and shorelines and baselines. When a country disappears, our complete regime of maritime boundaries on which we now work will be completely destabilized. So it is going to open up a complete new era of destabilization in the maritime space and maritime domain with unknown consequences for which we are very, very ill prepared. We are also going to end up in opening up the questions of what happens to loss of culture, language, history, what happens to the sovereign obligations of a state that no longer exists? What happened to the water over which that island or that state once existed? Does it become international water? Or are the sovereign rights still there? These are very fundamental questions for which the international community is not even scratching his head. All I'm saying is that we need to work on these issues. We are grappling with the concept and the ideas whether I should call somebody a refugee or not refugee. You can call whatever you like, but they are refugees. Mm -hmm. They will move. They will not walk towards the sea. When the sea level rises, these people will try and go anywhere which is safe and dry. You can call him a refugee, you may not call him a refugee, but he will go, he will move. Mm. So in the case of Bangladesh, Bangladesh is a frontline state in the face of the challenge of climate change. In my understanding, it's also the global laboratory for climate change impacts, because all that we know of the science of impacts of climate change, the adverse impacts of climate change is already happening on the grounds of Bangladesh. But the very basic consequence that is going to happen to Bangladesh is that it will lose about 20% of its territory to the sea, with the rising sea. And the sea level is rising. According to the IPCC's report, a one meter sea level rise will entail a 20% loss of Bangladesh's territory. And a country of the size of Bangladesh, which is the world's most heavily populated country with the highest density of population per square kilometers, with a population size of 170 million people, a 20% loss of territory to the sea will cause a climate refugee population of 25 to 30 million people, according to the government's country strategy paper. Where are they going to be, those 25 or 35 million persons? Do, will, 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 will the international community have to uh, impose these, those refugees to the neighboring countries? So what are going to be the discussion between the government? How can we come to such a decision? I can tell you very clearly, uh, given the space within the country, the internal capacity to absorb is not physically possible. Mm -hmm. So they'll have to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we are going to end up with spillover or transboundary migration. B everything is problematic for the reason that Bangladesh is bordered by India on all three sides. As a matter of fact, we are only bordered by India on all sides except for a small stretch with Myanmar. But the Indo-Bangladesh border has been unilaterally fenced by India. So it's a completely fenced border. And it's also a very fen fenced border, which is also fairly lethal in the sense that anybody illegally approaching the fence is shot out by the Indian border guards. Ne dites pas ça so, au président des États-Unis. Tell that to the pre president of the United States. Il est en train de visiter justement les différents modèles de murs. Just visiting the different models of walls which can be built. So it's it's maybe funny, but it's more serious than it seems when you see presently how the lack of political will to put an end to certain conflicts in certain part of the world. What is the organization who will be able to take organize uh, take uh, decisions? Is the IOM have a clear mandate to uh, do something like that? We, if a population loses its territories and has to go elsewhere, there is a shrinking willingness by 
governments, by states, to take on more responsibility or even to fulfill the responsibilities that they already have under international conventions and covenants to which they are party. But the terminology is also, uh, and definitions are, are a problem. Um, as the ambassador started to say, you know, w at what point um, can you say that a person is an environmental mover mm -hmm. person as opposed to economic or, or whatever? If you have a, a family in Nigeria that feels it has to move because oil exploitation has destroyed the means of livelihood, whether that's fishing mm -hmm. or farming or access to markets, is that environmental? Is it economic? Is it governance? Is it resource? Is it bad planning? And what percentage of each, and therefore what label do you give the person? Because it's, in the end, the labels are what states use to uh, take on or avoid responsibilities. We have a problem even with the term migrant, which has become mm -hmm. uh, somewhat derogatory or, mm -hmm. or threatening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at what point or income level is a migrant actually an expat or a, a member of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, these you know, words matter. Um, and politicians and the media and so many people scatter them around and use mm -hmm. them alternately in ways that can mislead uh, and, and again generate fear of other um, in a way that is not helpful to finding solutions and, and getting a system um, going in in regions in particular, because that's the most likely place where you will get solutions, but also on the global scale to, to get states to recognize that all people have rights, regardless of whether they are regular or irregular. Mm -hmm. And again, the term illegal migrant is very wrong. There are general assembly resolutions against it, because a person cannot be illegal. And in most cases, um, the contraventions of migration law are not actually criminal. Uh, they may be administrative offenses and so on. But so all, all these things around words and definitions uh, are problematic and, and have not kept pace with how the world now lives. Et on voit bien que certains parties politiques... And you can see that certain political parties, I say certain political parties, are just uh, uh, fueling this confusion on the words and the terminology so without uh, ta talking yes, about uh, climate refugees. Internally displaced people, refugees. In the film, they kept talking about uh, Syrian refugees in Syria. Well, oh. you cannot be a refugee unless you've crossed a border. But again, um, these, these things are tied up with legal obligations uh, and, and perceived responsibilities by states. Uh, and it's coming up in the Global Compact on Migration discussions where there is really a very strong resistance to anything binding and mm -hmm. even, even to things where basic humanity should, should be brought to bear. Generally speaking, you, one could feel in the film that the militaries and the uh, people surrounding the, are uh, some warning, but uh, they say don't count on, uh, upon us to do all the work when there was Katrina a storm in, in the military had to come and they had to do a job which is not the, 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 at the heart of their uh, missions. And maybe you have some military saying, OK, don't count too much on us. Uh, climate change is not a military problem. It is far deeper, far, far more fundamental. But the militaries will have to be drawn in when the consequences begin to happen. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem the military is trying to warn, that we cannot be drawn in at the very last moment, because the militaries are not trained for this job. So if the military has to be drawn in to work on the impacts of climate change, they have to be given a mission. They have to be trained for that. They have to be retooled for that. And that needs time. That is what the military is trying to warn. I will raise with you a more fundamental question. As my IOM colleague is referring to the obligations and the political acceptance of terminologies and obligations, are we as humans in conflict with nature? Our political systems, is it in conflict with nature? Because the nature does not recognize the Westphalian system that we have built for ourselves. We probably need to look at more deeply to see whether we need to adapt to the nature's changes. 
because we are going through a fundamental shift in the way the earth systems are changing, whether our weather are changing, our climate is changing. Are we in a moment which is historic or civilizational when we re need to re-look at our systems and rethink whether these are the systems that can support us for the next centuries or we need to work something different? Mm -hmm. Madame l'ambassadrice, uh, qu'est-ce que vous pensez justement de cette réflexion sur So, and you, what do you think about the, the, uh, the reflection about nature and uh, how far can we act on that and manage that? Is our role as a human being is to fight against the, the excess of nature or do we have to accept this nature? It, there must be maybe some sort of resilience. Both. I think it's really important that we accept the fact that there's now a need for urgency in climate action. And of course, this really emerged in a lot of the discussions that were um, uh, featured at COP23. We also need to build resilience. So when we have a number of natural disasters, we should be ready for them. And we should ensure that the way in which we are ready for them integrates human rights. So we're aware that marginal groups, for instance, are more vulnerable to the impacts of disasters and climate change. And so we should be ready for that, and we should protect them and ensure that uh, our nat national systems uh, protect them. But at a more global scale, I think it's really important that we stop building walls mm -hmm. and that we really uh, become uh, embracing of the movement of people. And this is a philosophical shift. I was the daughter of a, an immigrant in Fiji, and I'm very, very, a very proud Fijian, but my father didn't come from Fiji. And yet, um, I am so integrated into Fijian life that I see no difference, and now I'm an ambassador for Fiji. And Fiji has been, I think, either the only country in the world or one of the few countries in the world which has actually said to its Pacific Island nations, come here. When you lose your land or when your land becomes unlivable, mm -hmm. We will offer our country for you to live. Very good. We've made that gesture. It's very important, and I'm very proud that our leaders have done that. But the question is now... Mais que ça a déjà des résultats? Do we, can you already see the results? Can you already see the result? Are people coming? One country has already bought freehold land in Fiji for the purpose of settling its people. So we know that they are also planning this. But now the question, as a receiving state, is what are the rules of engagement? We need to protect cultural autonomy. We need to ensure that we don't grab other people's rights over their seabed, for instance, or over their fishing resources. And so there has to be a system now where we agree how that seabed is going to be administered. And I think these are really important questions which are legal, and they are a direct result of the offer that Fiji has made. Fiji needs answers to those questions as well, because we don't want to, to go around grabbing other people's resources. This is a generous gesture, but we need to know what the rules of engagement are. Things which was, uh, were promised, so you can now ask your questions. In order to understand you well, please ask your questions and do not make long statements. If you wish so, you can say to whom you ask your question, but otherwise you can pu uh, ask a general question. Uh, I have some difficulties in seeing you, but I see hands raising here in the front, so please ask your question. Don't hesitate. Please speak in the microphone so that everybody can hear you. So thank you very much for being here for this discussion. And I'd like to address my question to the ambassador of Fiji and maybe also in the role of one of the leaders of the COP uh, uh, negotiations. And this is um, something that has been mentioned uh, just uh, in a fleeting manner in, during the movie, which is um, overpopulation. And it hasn't been discussed during the movie, uh, but I, it also merges with something that uh, Mr. the General has mentioned about rethinking the ways we do things in our systems. And the question is, has, the que has this um, issue of overpopulation been addressed in discussions and 
in plans for actions in the COPD e expressly? And um, if yes, how? And also touching on the question of human rights. If um, this is a right for people to take decisions on um, reproduction, on um, increasing uh, the population, when does it stop to be a human right to do that when it interferes mm -hmm. in a larger scale with um, climate change and um, human displacement and so on? So, thank you. So on the first question of um, the uh, issue of overpopulation and climate action, the, the Warsaw International Mechanism, which uh, was negotiated some years ago, um, was intended to address the issues of the loss and damage coming from climate change. And um, it is a, a work program, which is a rolling work program, and it includes a task force on displacement. Overpopulation, as my, it's my understanding, is going to be included as part of that uh, overall work program. And in fact, the Warsaw International Mechanism Executive Committee just uh, sat in, in Bonn this very week to consider the work program. So it'll be very interesting to get the report of the Warsaw International uh, uh, Mechanism to see how overpopulation is included in that. But one thing it is very clear that overpopulation really increases the competition for land and resources. And so therefore, one of the important outcomes of COP23, which was an outcome on agriculture and a work program on agriculture, agriculture and the, uh, the agricultural sector is one of the largest emitters um, in the world. And yet there hasn't been, in, in my opinion, enough focus on agriculture. So that means agricultural methods which are intended to reduce emissions, but also including the agricultural sector in uh, climate action generally. I think that the agriculture work program has the capacity to address issues of overpopulation as well, particularly in relation to competition for land and arable land. So that's, that's, a, that's an interesting area which we will now see now that the agriculture program has been launched. On the issue of the integration of human rights, there hasn't been enough conversation about the importance of human rights in climate action. And I think it's because many countries in the world feel that this discourse on human rights is about liability, is about responsibility, and they don't want anything new about climate action and responsibilities. That's many countries. But increasingly, countries in the world are now saying, no, no, no. When we adapt and when we mitigate, we cannot exclude the voices of people. And you know, we're very proud that COP23 is called by many people as the people's COP. Because what we aim to do is put people in the middle of the conversation. You can't do anything in relation to climate action unless you talk to people. And when you think about 10 years ago, when, when people were talking to trees or talking about environmentally friendly ways of, of doing things, they were called weirdos. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody's doing it. So what's changed? What's changed is people and their attitudes. Society has really accepted the need to move forward and show climate ambition. So then if people are in the middle of the conversation, how can you exclude human rights and the rights of the individual? And so I see the need to integrate human rights in all aspects of climate change and climate action. And I believe that if you don't include people in this conversation, then climate action will be less effective and less urgent. And it's so important, I think, for the outcomes of anything you do in relation to climate change. And that's why I'm very pleased that we had a very strong focus on human rights at, the, at COP23. Merci. Je voudrais juste rappeler, euh, je voudrais qu'on puisse ce soir prendre un maximum. I would like uh, to take a maximum of questions. Can I ask you to be a more, to be a bit shorter in your questions so that everybody can ask a question? So I was on this side. Now I start, I start on the other side. I see a hand raising. Do you have a microphone? The mic is coming. Thank you. I'm listening to you. It's really um, just a fantastic opportunity for me. My name is Nahla Haidar. 
and I happen to be a member of the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, who will proudly present with you, Excellency, tomorrow the new general recommendation. All of it is music to my ear, but I felt like the issue of definition, as usual in the international system, takes us back and forth. It reminded me of 20 years ago when inter internally displaced persons had nobody in charge for them. We struggled, and I think Mrs. Helke would remember because we uh, worked together with her, uh, with her spouse at the time in humanitarian affairs. So there was no mandate. There was no, because they were displaced within their country. And then, as you rightly said, Madam Ambassador, the people, the concern, the NGO, civil society, we can't just leave them for the, then we managed to have more clarity. I'm not suggesting fantastic clarity, but mandate can change, definition can come about. So I think also if we stick to the words refugee climatique, we're not, we'll be disservicing those people because this is not voluntary refugee. These mm. people are pushed because of the action of others. And the movie, what I reproach to the movie, the climate justice notion was not there. Very little, they sprinkled it a little bit. And at the same time, the issue is about climate justice, okay. is about human rights. So how do we do that? Uh, the notion that we could call them uh, climate change induced migrant? Could that be one way of naming them that will also preserve their dignity but show the factor that pushed them to leave? Mm -hmm. uh, some discussion around this and how can we move the, because definitions are gonna be very important one point or the other, thank you. Merci de prolonger ainsi le thank you to go on in this debate uh, on terminology. Uh, uh, we would like to have your explanation if you don't mind. Before, the difficulty is you know, what percentage of the motivation of someone having to leave or feeling compelled to leave is environmental and what percentage of it may be something else. Um, again, I think it's more to do with ensuring that individuals get the right treatment, whatever caused them to move in the first place. Um, do we call people who no longer have access to water or no longer have access to food, food migrants? I, but they're not refugees because non-access to food is not uh, a ground in the Refugee Convention for claiming asylum somewhere else. It's messy. Um, I, I wanted to come back to something that the General said about the role of the state or the, the state of the state mm -hmm. uh, and the Westphalian model. What we're seeing in migration is that in many cases cities or local level authorities are managing things in a much more humane uh, and better way than is done at the national level. Because national governments uh, are, are focused on sort of national, often security mm -hmm. issues, um, but at, at city level, they, they see migrants, uh, in both internal and international migrants, as people, they're not just numbers. Uh, and they also see them as, as resources, as, uh, as valuable members of society when they manage them appropriately and enable migrants to, to give of their best uh, and integrate effectively. So I think there is a bigger shift in, uh, in seeing cities take charge uh, and, and certainly some of the discussions on the Global Compact are trying to give a larger role to mayors and regional and local authorities in decision making on migration policy. Because cities need talent, they need workers, they need uh, all the different things that both internal and international migrants can bring. Maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah. So um, could I just, sure. you know, I mean, we've been, because we're talking about the cross-border movement of people, and the research now shows that most people are staying within their country of origin when they are forced to leave the places where they live because of a, an extreme weather event. And so to get back what I said earlier, the critical piece is building the capacity of governments to respond to the extreme weather events that are happening because one of the things that we see all over the world, and it really doesn't matter where you live, is that no government has the capacity to deal with the extreme weather events that are currently happening where you have 
over 200 kilometer per hour sustained winds, and you're completely destroying the infrastructure of the places where people live. So for me, it's really important that we focus on the places where we are currently living to determine whether or not we have the capacity to deal with the environmental changes that are happening. Because if we don't, then there will be the cross-border movement of people. And then people will be forced to leave the places that they know and love because most people don't want to leave the places that they call home. And so we should not be expecting that. We should be focused on preventing that and making sure that we're doing everything possible to protect people's human rights so that that's not the consequence for them. On progress dans ce débat. So we, we progress in this debate. I see another hand raising. Uh, I'm subjective in my choices, so, but I assume I am, I keep, stick to it. In the middle of the room, here the microphone is coming to you. Thank you. Thank you. For Miss Khan, I was positively impressed by by the, what you said about stop building walls and embracing embracing movements. And I would like you to explain a little bit better how this can be done, uh, how society can stop building walls, and how they can transform uh, migrants maybe also in a resource. Uh, in so I think the example that I gave of Fiji offering itself, its, its land and its resources to other countries in the Pacific is probably the best example. Um, where we know this is going to happen to our Pacific Island neighbors, and we have decided that we will offer our home to them. Um, and that is really a classic example of how we would deal with slow onset um, uh, climate change, because we know that slowly the sea level is rising and that more and more villages are going to have to move. The question of when to move is, of course, a, a sovereign country's decision. But the second on the building of walls is directly relevant to this issue of climate justice. If we are going to be working with people and deciding on when they should be displaced or when they should stay, which village should build a seawall, then climate justice and really um, ensuring that human rights are integrated becomes in the center of this conversation. And so therefore, for instance, you might see that climate action and the displacement of people actually has a transformative role. So you might go to a village where traditionally women have not had a voice uh, because the, the elders, uh, the male elders make all the decisions in this traditional setting. And because you want to make sure that everybody is consulted in the decision, you will say, where are the women? And then suddenly you have to find ways of ensuring that you're consulting with women before the decision is made as to whether this village is going to move. Because there's not much point in moving a village if you haven't addressed the issue of water supply, which is really in the middle of, of a woman's concern in the village. So then climate action has a transformative agenda. You can transform society simply by insisting on a form of participation that hasn't been part of our culture. And this shows the synergy, and which was represented at COP by both the Gender Action Plan, which talks about the integration of women's voices in climate action, and the Indigenous Peoples Platform, which also recognizes the important role of indigenous communities in climate action. And the relationship between both is one that is very interesting, the indigenous women's voices. So, I mean, this is another wall coming down. It's a, it's a figurative wall, it's a philosophical wall, but it's an important one because it promotes climate justice. Thank you. Monsieur, qui est devant, qui lève la main depuis un moment. This gentleman in the front who is raising his hand for a moment already. You will have the floor. The discussion uh, is terribly interesting, but has gotten all out of, off of a point that, Xavier, you made in the beginning. And I must say that as far as the film is concerned, I found the militarization of the film to be offensive. Offensive. 
uh, uh, particularly the scenes of war over and over again. And I think the major fault of the film is the limited definition of security. It w there's nothing to do with human security, it's military security, raison d'etat, and I think that they missed an enormous opportunity to make a different kind of statement uh, by just showing the military uh, making uh, s solar panels and showing all the battles that could come. I mean, there are ways in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, there are discussions between California, Colorado, uh, there's an organization in Geneva, Water Hub, for different kinds of negotiation and dealing this, but making this a security issue in the sense of a military one, I found it to be a failure. Alors, est-ce que là vous avez une question? Profitez-en pour poser une question au général. You have a question, so take the opportunity to ask your question to the general about this militarization. No, I asked the general to comment on what I've just said. Très bien. C'est formidable. Okay, wonderful. It's a military approach, I say, of things. Bien. Thank you, sir. But I can't speak for the director of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> non, but, on ne vous le demande pas. But my understanding is that this is one message they were trying to send to the political leaders, and they only touched on the hard security part of it. Mm. I completely agree that a larger part of the security will be the human security dimensions where the human security impacts are going to come on the people. But the film probably only acts on the hard security or the state security part of the story. So that's a story they're going to try and tell the leaders so that they take action on the decision making. But I also would like to say that the military does not believe in militarization of climate change. But the military is only warning that there needs to be a point of securitization mm -hmm. where the military is called in by the political leaders to step in, and the securitization point will differ from country to country, from region to region, but that's the point that has to be taken into cognizance. But the military so certainly does not believe in militarization of the issue, and the film repeatedly said, this is not our problem. This is a problem you could address yourselves. Mm -hmm. Nous avons encore le temps pour... Uh, we have yet a uh, uh, little time to ask some more questions. You will have the microphone, the gentleman in the third row. Uh, just a short question with respect to numbers in migration. Um, I think you mentioned in the beginning 250 million people by 2050, is that mm -hmm. right? That's, that's yeah. correct. However, en revanche, nous n'avons pas une but however, we do, we do not have a precise idea of uh, how it is uh, uh, going to take place and in which pace. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, we're talking about Syria, 1.5 million, and, and the outrage that came out in the European Union with respect to that. I'm just, I don't even know, maybe this is a general question for anybody who would like to answer, but what does 250 million people look like? Um, so what I can say, I mean, to go back to what I said before, this is about the internal movement of people primarily. So if you look at the way sea level rise, for instance, is affecting the United States, it is absolutely clear based on the current meltdown of the Arctic that millions of people on the coastal communities of the United States, for instance, Southeast Florida, they cannot build a seawall to protect people because the water is rising underneath. And so the question becomes, how do you relocate populations mm -hmm. internally? And this is the biggest governance issue that we face because most countries in the world did not sign up to internally relocate their populations within borders and take on that responsibility. And in the United States, and that's what's happening with the indigenous communities in Alaska, where they are making the decision that they can no longer stay where they are, and they've been looking to the federal government to for that assistance, but the federal government has never stepped into that role. And so there's no one federal government agency that has that responsibility or funding, and this is the United States that I'm talking about. And I know in Fiji, the country of Fiji has also been struggling with the, in regard to what is the governance mechanism to relocate populations mm -hmm. within countries. And so that 
to me, is the issue that we need to be focused on because that is the reality of what's going to happen as sea level rise accelerates. And as I said before, you know, if we don't figure out that piece in regard to how populations are going to be internally relocated within their countries, then we're looking at the cross-border movement of people. And there will be some countries that will disappear. And again, it's because of our collective action to not reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Like, I just feel it as an individual responsibility. It's because of me that people are losing their homes. And if we recognize that, my, my hope is, is that we would stop re contributing to this problem. Encore deux questions. We have two questions. Two more questions. Left. Somebody in the top. On the back of the room. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, I am from Nepal. Uh, in fact, I am not on the coast, coastal country, but I am from the mountainous country. And I see uh, on the film that means climate refugees, when you say it only would be caused by the level of the say, sea rise, sea rise, uh, sea rising level in the coastal countries, island countries. But uh, from the perspective of this mountainous country, if you look that means the mountains, mountains are also being barren. And you mentioned that ice, that means the glaciers are retreating and melting mm -hmm. fast. So the, we currently, we simply say, it is internally displaced, but the people certainly when they forced uh, their settlement from their, say, living from their mountains to the plain areas. And then, as we have already mentioned, that the capacity of the country mm -hmm. concerned may not be able to accommodate them. The people will be forced to the trans-border movement. So I think the climate refugees concept or climate refugee idea would also go on the mountainous countries as well. And I do not see in this film that any idea or aspect has been included. Thank you. Merci en quelque sorte de nous avoir aidé à aussi délocaliser, si j'ose dire. Thank you. You helped us to outsource the, this problem also to mountainous uh, countries. Uh, somebody would like to answer. I know there are a lot of persons who would like to ask a question on the balcony. We don't see you. I know you are asking for the floor. So you have the floor now. I don't know if it's a gentleman or a lady. It's just a, a lady. Thank you. The general one. Uh, last night here, we had a very interesting discussion on, on business and human rights and the responsibility of mis businesses. And I think it's uh, in the film we, we see like the state um, response and the, the national security related to the question of climate change and, and maybe the people response. But what is your view on the responsibility of business and how is the best way to ask uh, business um, community to to tackle this issue in a responsible manner, if you have a view on that. Thank you. Uh, there's been several uh, discussions and debates about integration of the private sector into climate adaptation and in climate action. And the private sector and the commercial sector of any country is a big part of the economic life and commercial life, and they have to be brought into the scene and integrated into climate action and climate adaptation. I am completely in agreement with you that without integration of the private sector and the private business communities into climate action, we cannot achieve the right results that we desire. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to a term of our debate. Uh, I thank you very much for being here and for your attention. Uh, thank you to those who organized the debate. I think I thank also all the volunteers who allow this festival to be organized in the best uh, possible conditions. Thank you to the interpreters who helped us to understand what is happening and what is being said today evening. And on behalf of everybody, all the panelists, I, uh, on, on, sorry, on behalf of everybody, I thank the panelists for being here. And thank you for the high quality of their uh, interventions.